Hi everyone. It is still September 14, 2019. I came across this article, Class Action Lawsuit Against Smartphones. Users say they weren't warned about radiation risks. The smartphones, 11 smartphone models, Apple and Samsung, uh, exceed the federal radiation safety limits. This was posted last month in the Chicago Tribune, which led to a lawsuit. A class action lawsuit on behalf of consumers and well how many of us have been screaming that FCC uh, federal safety limits and testing for cell phones and all other while wireless devices over 20 years old and I'm not even sure what testing is involved um, they don't apply to most current wireless radiation emitting products. They don't apply to the way most people use or are exposed to most current wireless radiation emitting products and infrastructure. And we continue to be saturated. The, the saturation just continues to get more and more uh, dense, intense, and we're all suffering because of it. Even if you feel okay, those frequencies are affecting you. And as I was reading this, you know, I was thinking about the very many subscribers of mine that have been subscribers for many years they have, and I have spoken to them about the dangers of smartphones and iPhones especially, but the 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G is dangerous as well. And I am really struck with how many have never given up. The iPhone, the smartphones, which are particularly dangerous, uh, won't give it up. I am really surprised. Yeah, we all have free will, but when you know how dangerous that product is, you know the dangers, not only physical, you know the dangers that the smartphone, the iPhone in particular, are weapons. They're weapons. They know all of this and they still won't give it up. So I came across this and there are several videos that you might want to check out um, embedded in this article. Um, but I watched again this video. So I'm just going to play a few minutes of it and then I'm going to read about all of those places in your brain that are close to where those frequencies are emitted into your brain the functions you know of those particular parts of your brain right here uh, this uh, this model uh, Dr. Herberman uh, is you know, an adult brain model, is that what you're saying? That's correct. And then where, uh, where does the, on this model, where's the uh, cell phone? Uh, the thing sticking out on the side is supposed, the cardboard thing is The cell phone is right here. Right there. Okay, the so cell phone is here, and the, what you're saying is that, uh, and this actually, you know, so we're trying to keep this uh, close to the model. The cell phone is here and you're saying that the uh, directed energy from that cell phone goes in like this and then expands out right. into, into the into the tissue of the brain yeah and this now, shows so in just turning it uh, in another view uh, that's what an adult brain you know, what's your basis for that uh, are there uh, are there studies that prove this is that what you're saying this was done uh, with uh, models in which uh, radio frequency signals that are uh, in the same uh, range as uh, uh, the commonly used cell phones okay, were used okay, now, for this. Now this would be a model 
of a child's brain at what age? Five years old. Five-year-old child. Uh, fi do you have research that shows, or a public health uh, research, uh, Dr. Carpenter, that five-year-old children will use a cell phone? Is that possible? I've had inquiries from parents of two-year-old children who give them their child the on cell phone to play with. Uh, I don't think most five-year-olds are making phone calls, but when kids get in elementary school, okay, so they begin. so okay. Now here we've seen you know we've seen the effect. Here's the uh, adult uh, brain effect of use of the cell phone, and then we look at the child again. Um, so the cell phone's here, is that right? Correct. Cell phone's here, and it's a very deep penetration, you're saying. Now, is this kind of penetration of the energy of a cell phone, the radio frequencies, radiation, we're saying, um, would you say that from, from looking at this visually, is it your testimony that most of the brain of a child would be, uh, would receive uh, s some of this energy? That's correct. Most of the brain, at least on that side of the head, uh, would be uh, absorbing uh, that energy. And it's a simple explanation for it. Uh, one is that the skull is considerably thinner in a, in a child, and it doesn't uh, reach maturity until uh, the 20s. In addition to that, the nerves in the brain uh, in adult are, uh, are protected by a myelin sheath. In uh, children, the myelin uh, has not fully developed, so there's several reasons for the increased absorption in a child. Well, so when did Dennis Kucinich leave Congress? In 2013. Oh, wow, 2013. So that, that video uh, is quite old. That was before a lot of the very dangerous very dangerous uh, smartphones and iPhones that have recently been put on the market as safe and we all know they're not safe at all. So in looking at those two um, examples of an adult brain and a child's brain well, this is an adult brain, so this is the area where those frequencies are hitting the brain an awful lot. The hippocampus, the amygdala, the basal ganglia, and the, uh, there was another one. Well, let's, oh, the cerebellum. So, uh, let's just review what those parts of the brain are for. The amygdala, processing of emotions, fear responses, and pleasure, aggressive behavior, conditions such as anxiety, autism, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, phobias are suspected of being linked to abnormal functioning of the amygdala owing to damage, developmental problems, or neurotransmitter imbalance. How many kids are using cell phones? And how many adults? Well, pretty much the entire population. I see children in stores with their parents they're sitting in a, um, a cart, a supermarket cart, and they're staring at cell phones that are only like inches away from the child's face. But think about all of those kids who, oh, they're not holding that cell phone away from the uh, away from their brain there it's right up against their ear right up against their ear 
Wow. So, the amygdala, well, think about how many people have anxiety, how many kids have autism, how many are depressed, and how many are having emotional responses that they're not even understanding, how many are scared, how many are aggressive and hostile and, and well, they call us hateful when they're actually the hateful ones, but uh, could it be that their brains have been damaged? But also realize that it's not just those smartphones and iPhones, but it's the Wi-Fi that so many of my subscribers, knowing how dangerous it is, they're sitting in it. They don't get rid of it. And the smart meters, and the cell towers, and those extremely low frequency emitting structures called the Gwen Towers. We are so saturated that, well, it's kind of surprising that we still are walking around, but many are walking around with great trouble. So, the hypothalamus, homeostasis, and hormones. The uh, hypothalamus regulates body temperature, blood pressure, caloric intake, expenditures of calories at a fairly constant level. It has connections to the autonomic nervous system through which it can send signals to influence things like heart rate, digestion, perspiration. If the hypothalamus senses that the body's temperature is too high, it may send a message to sweat glands to cause perspiration to cool down the body. The hypothalamus can restore homeostasis, and another way the hypothalamus can influence behavior in general is through the control of hormone release from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is a hormone secreting gland that sits just below the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus secretes substances into the bloodstream that are known as releasing hormones. It releases hormones that have been synthesized in the pituitary gland. Hormones such as like the growth hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, uh, which, uh, well, sexual development, reproduction, the luteinizing hormone, testosterone, production and reproduction the endrocorticotropic hormone, stress fear response, thyroid simulating hormone, metabolism, and prolactin milk production. How many people do you know have thyroid problems? How many people do you know uh, are having difficulty getting pregnant? You know, and of those, how many are still glued to their cell phones and sitting in Wi-Fi and not caring about all of these frequencies? The hypothalamus also synthesizes a couple of hormones, oxytocin and vas, uh, vasopressin. These are then sent to the posterior pituitary for release into the bloodstream. Oxytocin can act as a hormone and a neurotransmitter. It has important roles in facilitating childbirth. Uh, and lactation, but also has been the subject of a lot of recent research due to its hypothesized role in compassion and social bonding. How many people do you know have genuine compassion and are capable of, well, just basic social bonding. So 
I bumped into a neighbor who um, started talking about neighbors that she has. And these are young neighbors, like 30 and under, that they never have once looked up to say hello to her. And I said, wow, I have neighbors down below that are just like that. They don't look up. And these are, I'd say, 35 and younger. I have seen one neighbor of mine every single day walking a dog, and dogs are usually what can, you know, kind of throw people together. Uh-uh, not with this one. Will not look up, will not acknowledge, will not wave, will not say hello. That's kind of scary, uh, especially when other neighbors are noting that kind of behavior in their neighbors. So, the cerebellum. Cerebellum is Latin for little brain, and indeed the cerebellum looks a bit like a smaller version of our brain. It protrudes from the back and bottom of the cerebral cortex. It is involved in modulation of movement. When we make a voluntary movement, the signal to initiate that movement originates in the motor corte cortices. Uh, before the signal is sent to our muscles, however, it is sent to the cerebellum. Think about the increase in Parkinson's, MS, Cerebellum also gets information from the position of the body from the spinal cord. It uses this information to coordinate the movement and allows us to make it a smooth manner while maintaining our balance and equilibrium. How many of you are having difficulty maintaining your balance? What I thought was very interesting and it relates to me personally. Damage, hmm, damage to the cerebellum. Now, I had a thalamic stroke, and one of the symptoms that I experienced was it was so bizarre, disconcerting, but and I noticed it when I was cooking. So I was in the restaurant business. I was a caterer. And, you know, when I was in the kitchen, you know, I always set it up where I didn't even have to think in terms of what I was doing. I just kind of moved about very fluidly and got the job done. Well, suddenly, let's say I wanted salt or pepper or something well, I would think, okay, next, pepper. But something was wrong. Um, I literally, the movement to get it was not operating. I had like a four second delay on everything that I was doing. You need a pen? Well, you just reach for it. What if you had this like four second delay? Your brain was not, it was so, I don't know, slowed or something. And then eventually you were able to get the pen. It was so bizarre. Fortunately, it didn't last. Um, it lasted, I'd say, for just a couple of months. But it was the weirdest uh, experience that I've ever had well damage to the cerebellum problems not in the initiation but in the execution of movement movements may be abnormally timed jerky and riddled with tremors cerebellum the thalamus well oh my god someone who experiences damage in the cerebellum through a stroke may also display cognitive and emotional disturbances or deficits. Um, 
I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that I had a stroke in the cerebellum, but something was very off. Anyway, ba basal ganglia. Well, the function most frequently associated with the basal ganglia involves movement, receiving information from the cortex. After the information is processed, it is sent back to the cortex by the way of the thalamus. Hmm. Thus, the pathway from the cortex to the basal ganglia and then back to the cortex via the thalamus forms a loop, the functions, motor control to facilitate movement and inhibit competing movements. And they talk about um, Parkinson's and so, um, it's also thought to have roles in habitual behavior, drug addiction, OCD, and we have an increase in all of this, and also roles in emotion and cognition. Thus, in addition to movement disorders, the basal ganglia are now being investigated in, in attempts to understand disorders like Tourette's syndrome, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, so let me just once again read something that I hope you begin to think about your use of that smartphone, your use of that iPhone, you sitting in your home with Wi-Fi, um, and you giving your children these devices. Okay, electromagnetic signals from cell phones can change your brain waves and behavior, mind control by cell phone. They didn't give you the cell phone because they thought you would just love it. They gave you the cell phone because it's a weapon they are using. All our thoughts, sensations, and actions arise from bioelectricity generated by neurons and transmitted through complex neural circuits inside our skull. Electrical signals between neurons generate electrical fields that radiate out of brain tissue as electrical waves that can be picked up by electrodes touching a person's scalp. Me measurements of such brain waves and EEGs provide powerful insight into brain function and a valuable diagnostic tool for doctors. Indeed, so fundamental are brain waves to the internal workings of the mind, they have become the ultimate legal definition drawing the line between life and death. Brain waves change with a healthy person's conscious and unconscious mental activity and state of arousal. Scientists can selectively control brain function by transcranial magnetic stimulation remotely now. This technique uses powerful pulses of electromagnetic radiation beamed into a person's brain to jam or excite particular brain circuits. That's what your cell phone can do. Could the electrical signals coming from a phone affect certain brain waves operating in resonance with cell phone transmission frequencies? After all, the caller's cerebral cortex is just centimeters away from radiation broadcast from the phone's antenna. The cerebral cortex what does the brain's cerebral cortex do? It's that thin layer of the brain that covers the outer portion of the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is the most highly developed part of the human brain and is responsible for thinking, perceiving, producing, understanding language. Most information processing occurs in the cerebral cortex along with, well, determining intelligence, personality, motor function, planning, organization, touch, sensation, processing, sensory information, language, processing. Wow. Well, yeah. And then you see all of these people with those fabulous smartphones and iPhones 
right smack up against their heads. So there were these two studies. Uh, one showed that when the cell phone was transmitting the power of a characteristic brainwave pattern called alpha waves in the person's brain was boosted significantly. Alpha waves fluctuate at a rate of 8 to 12 cycles per second, um, 8 to 12 hertz. These brain waves reflect a person's state of arousal and attention. Alpha waves are generally regarded as an indicator of reduced mental effort, cortical idling, mind wandering. The alpha wave is really regulating the shift of attention between external and internal inputs. Alpha waves increase in power when a person shifts his or her consciousness of the external world to internal thoughts. They are also the key brain wave signatures of sleep. The second study, the cell phone signals alter a person's behavior during, during the call. Ah, cell phone signals alter a person's behavior during the call. The effects of the disrupted brain wave patterns continued long after the phone was switched off, which was a completely unexpected finding. We didn't suspect any effect on EEG after switching off the phone. We were interested in studying the effect of mobile phone signals on sleep itself. Some of the test subjects had difficulty falling asleep. Uh, researchers then monitored the men's brains, brain waves by EEG while the phone was switched on and off by a remote computer and also switched between standby, listen, and talk modes of operation for 30 minute intervals on different nights. The experiment revealed that after the phone was switched to talk mode, a different wave pattern called delta waves in the range of one to four hertz remained dampened for nearly one hour after the phone was shut off. These brain waves are the most reliable and sensitive marker of stage two sleep. Approximately 50% of total sleep consists of this stage. The subjects remained awake twice as long after the phone transmitting in talk mode was shut off. Although the test subjects had been sleep deprived the night before, they could not fall asleep for nearly one hour after the phone had been operating without their knowledge. Although this research shows that cell phone transmissions can affect a person's brain waves with persistent effects on behavior, Horn, one of the, um, one of the scientists doing these studies, Horn does not feel there's any need for concern that cell phones are damaging. Really? Gotta love your scientists. So, your cell phone is a psychotronic weapon of mass mind control producing and receiving signals when you are using that smartphone and iPhone in particular because the frequencies from those phones are stronger, more powerful, and but all of the phones, okay? So when you're using it, whether staring at it or it's up to your head or you hold it out a few inches, those frequencies are still being emitted right into your brain, producing and receiving signals that affect moods, thoughts, bodily functions. Your cell phone is a psychotronic weapon. Your cell phone can read and control and probably is reading and controlling your mind. So he goes into a scholarly article Exploring the notion that psychotronic weaponry is being used from near and afar to mind control us on a routine, daily basis, mind control activities are part of a larger effort the author calls the New Manhattan Project, the author of the scholarly article, and I will link below to this article, Other New Manhattan Chemtrail Project Agendas. So, mind control activities are part of a larger effort and the author calls it the New Manhattan Project. 
Chemtrails Exposed, a new Manhattan project. Electromagnetic energy can be produced and directed to influence human moods, thoughts, bodily functions. Devices that do this are known as psychotronic weaponry or psychotronics. Psychotronic weaponry utilizes electromagnetic energy frequencies primarily in the extremely low frequency because extremely low frequencies, well, that's the frequency range of the electromagnetic energy of the human brain uh, that is natural, that it sends and receives electromagnetic fields in the very low frequencies, 3 to 30 kilohertz, and super low, 30 to 300 hertz, ranges can also have psychotronic effects. Man-made electromagnetic energy signals produced and applied in the extremely low frequency range can be synchronized to human brain waves so that the brain becomes entrained. The targeted individual's brain waves are firstly scanned to determine the frequency of the electromagnetic uh, frequency of his or her brain. Then that same frequency produced by the targeted individual's brain is produced by the psychotronic weapon and directed at the targeted individual once the targeted individual's brain waves have been synchronized with the electromagnetic frequency produced by the psychotronic weapon the frequency produced by the psychotronic weapon is then gradually altered altered to produce any desired effect it is called the process of brain entrainment and this is happening. Hundreds of pertinent documents readily available by the Navy, the RAND Corporation, NASA, Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, Lincoln Laboratory, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Department of Energy, Battelle, Pacific Northwest Labs, many others. We know that they've all been involved. Uh, way back in the 30s, Alfred Lee Loomis, uh, was studying and writing about brain waves as he helped to develop the field of EEGs, which is the field of brain wave measurement. The same Loomis, who made his fortune in the electrical power industry and later went on to help develop technologies capable of bouncing electromagnetic communication signals off the ionosphere or transmitting them <clears throat> over thousands of miles. Um, and today's ionospheric heaters ah, of the new Manhattan Project. Fundamental technologies developed by Loomis. Ionospheric heaters, Nexrad, Doppler radar, HARP, and HARP, the many HARP facilities around the world, capable of producing tremendously strong electromagnetic signals and fields that can control the weather and influence our moods, thoughts, bodily functions. And if you want to learn more about Mr. Loomis, click on this hyperlink. You want to know more about the electrical power industry's potential motives here, click on uh, or go to the article and go to uh, QE Bono section. Coal fly ash, click on the Coal Fly Ash and the New Manhattan Project. These might be different links, so um, click on the link below and then click on the hyperlink. For more about the ionospheric heaters of today's New Manhattan Project, one can refer to Smoking Gun, the Harp and Chemtrails connection. So, earliest scientific papers applicable to modern psychotronic weaponry, published in 1955 as early as 1955, it wasn't until the 1960s that things in the field really started getting going. Among a few other early examples was 1961's research in electrical phenomena associated with aerosols, Bernard Vonnegut, who was involved in measuring the effects of electromagnetic directed at the effigy of a man in a small chamber surrounded by gas. 
This is, of course, analogous to today's everyday environment where airplanes saturate our atmosphere with very toxic chemicals and heavy metals, uh, man-made and man-made electromagnetic energy hitting us all over the place. Can't get away from it now. Bernard Vonnegut, an astute, all astute readers know, was instrumental in the early development of what has become today's New Manhattan Project. He was instrumental in weather modification, artificial cloud making. Um, he was one of the original Manhattan Project scientists, one of the trio of general electric scientists who rolled out the scientific era of weather modification, later went on to do space charge experiments in the vein of the new Manhattan Project. He wrote about introducing chemicals into the atmosphere or modifying the weather by altering electrical variables, atmospheric chemicals, and atmospheric electricity, the two key elements of the new Manhattan Project. By the mid-1960s, UCLA's Brain Research Institute studying the effects of electromagnetic fields upon human behavior. Uh, Dr. Gordon, How to Wreck the Environment, McDonald was writing about entraining people's brains with a man-made electronic signal from outer space. 1974, Dr. Michael Persinger, Persinger uh, wrote a book titled ELF, VLF, electromagnetic field effects. The book references and details many studies conducted with animals and humans pertaining to physiological and biochemical changes associated with those fields of energy, electromagnetic and extremely low and very low frequency ranges. And in the preface, Dr. Persing, Persinger writes that extremely low frequency signals are associated with weather changes, solar disturbances, and geophysical ionospheric perturbations. Okay, if we know that extremely low frequencies um, are associated with weather changes and solar disturbances, and we have an awful lot of those frequencies being used all the time in an increasing manner. So this is uh, the current radar, extremely low frequencies, all of these very defined cutouts of the blue is emitting extremely low frequencies. And this is a very uh, powerful pulse of an extremely low frequency. All of these very defined lines that I've been showing over and over and over again, um, pulsating away. Well, they can create solar disturbances, weather changes. So, um, Dr. Persinger also writes, the extremely low frequency signals are preferable because they have the capacity to penetrate structures which house living organisms. He's talking about weaponized electromagnetic frequencies, mind controlling people in their homes from outer space. There is no outer space. Okay. We've got satellites emitting electromagnetic frequencies. It's true. Go ahead. Leave your comments. There are no satellites. Fine. Um, he is most well known for inventing what is called the God Helmet. The God Helmet, a device placed on a subject's head, which could apparently produce in the subject the feeling of having a religious experience. United States patent granted in 1990 titled Cryogenic Remote Sensing Physiograph Details an Apparatus and Method for Remotely Scanning people, People's Brain Waves. This is significant because, as noted early, earlier, the process of brain entrainment means that you've got to get the frequencies going on in that person's brain in order to entrain, in order to deliver the same frequency that they've got going on in their brain, and then alter the frequency once it locks on to the frequency in the brain. 
Another U.S. patent granted in 1998, thermal excitation of sensory resonances, describes a method and apparatus for using directed microwave radiation or a laser beam to produce certain effects in humans. The patent explains that sleepiness, drowsiness, relaxation, a tonic smile, um, ptosis of the eyelids, the feeling of a knot in the stomach, sudden loose stools, and sexual excitement can all be artificially induced in humans using this technique. Any of you have these symptoms? I have. <laughs> An expert in the field of psychotronics has written a book detailing how we can be mind controlled by all internet connected devices. 2013, Mind War, by that fabulous, healthy individual, Dr. Michael Aquino, and I say healthy Sarcastically, uh, BWR mind control frequencies can, for instance, be inserted into the internet to be passively and indetectably, absent such sensors, received and radiated by any uh, um, accessing device from television stations to desktop com computers or cell phones. Uh, Michael Aquino, retired Lieutenant Colonel, Psychological Operations, 1st Special Forces Regiment, U.S. Army. Okay, so then he talks about his personal experiences. So conclusion, the frequencies used to control minds and influence body bodily functions, which are the extremely low, very low, um, I don't know, seriously low? <laughs> uh, what is S? Uh, super low? This was earlier today, um, or no, I'm sorry, this was 11.03 p.m. Eastern Standard Time last night. And look at our Doppler radar stations belting away, but if you um, pause this video, you can check out all of the extremely low frequencies that are also uh, pulsing away in a whole lot of regions. They don't only use extremely low frequencies to modify the weather, control the weather. They're controlling us. And, well, how about these extremely low frequencies? Uh, Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, yeah. Well, if you haven't seen my videos on extremely low frequencies uh, and the videos that I posted on Doppler radar emitting these frequencies, you, you have to know they are increasing the use of these frequencies you know, so when you hear Texas going blue, <laughs> blue, uh, you've got to wonder. You really have to wonder. All right, so, excuse me. Um, and I could go on and on showing you how they are so blasting us badly. <laughs> so... Frequencies used to control minds influence bodily functions, control moods, control thoughts, opinions, um, emotions, are the same frequencies that are germane to atmospheric phenomena. These frequencies are also fundamental to what is commonly referred to the smart grid. The smart grid involves having our fundamental biological processes hacked and hijacked. The organizations and people responsible for exploiting these frequencies are tapping into the fundamental processes of life itself. Without our full knowledge or consent, that is why the information is so important. That is why people are so resistant to smart meters and Wi-Fi, which play important roles in the smart grid. We are all assaulted by psychotronic weaponry in one way or the other. It's a good way to get people to do 
what somebody else wants without the targeted individuals knowing what hit them. Even if your average American were to come to grips with the reality and power of these technologies, convincing them that these technologies are being purposefully used against us on a routine daily basis is still a bridge too frickin' far. How many subscribers do I have still using, especially those smartphones, the <laughs> iPhones, <clears throat> and sitting in Wi-Fi? Most people simply refuse to believe that monumental institutions of industry, academia, government, would engage in such malicious and blatant violations of the public's trust. This is how they get away with it. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men should do nothing. Okay. So, many who are awake are doing nothing still using their smartphones, still sitting in Wi-Fi. Ask yourselves, please, ask yourselves, why is it that you're not concerned with your physical health, your emotional well-being? Why is it you're still using a product that you know is a weapon and can be used against you at any moment? At any moment, they can use frequencies from Wi-Fi, from uh, certainly the Gwen Towers, the extremely low frequencies, but why are you doing this to yourself? Are you, are you apathetic? Do you genuinely care about what is going on? Do you care about your children's future, your grandchildren's future? Or are you just watching this like somebody would just be watching TV? You know, this is where your interest is, just like somebody who's watching whatever is on TV. That's where their interest is. Are you giving that smartphone, the iPhone, a cell phone to your children, or an iPad, or any of these devices. They're all weapons. You've got to ask yourself why you're doing this. Why are you doing this? Why are you still sitting in Wi-Fi? Ask yourself why you don't care about your health, your family's health, your overall well-being. All links are below.